Hi, welcome to the next in our series of video lectures on practical electromagnetics for engineers. Today we're going to talk about the magnetic field and try to determine what the magnetic field is. Now, now many people find the magnetic field very, very confusing since it's not at all intuitive and the math actually gets somewhat complicated. There's a lot of accounting stuff and stuff to take care of when you do magnetic field calculations. And I think it helps to try to explain the origin of the magnetic field and show analogies with the electric field because we should by this time understand the electric field. And if we can think of the magnetic field just as another form of the electric field um, with some different mathematics wrapped around it, I think it really helps. If, re if you're in my class, you can go ahead and follow along in the book. We'll be covering chapter 5.1 in this lecture. So when we talked about conductivity and conduction, we looked at a voltage, a V, along a wire, and we know that you know, generally there aren't very strong electric fields in wires, but there's going to be basically be an electric field that goes in the wire this way, and that electric field is essentially going to accelerate the negative charges in that direction. And we can think about this, and many people do, as positive charges going in that direction. And we know that the, the force is basically going to be the charge times the electric field, and that this force is going to accelerate the charges. In order to explore this, let's look at a couple of cases. Uh, the first case we're going to look at is one we should be familiar with because we studied conductivity and conduction and currents and current densities. And that's where we essentially have a charge moving inside the wire. And uh, we're going to get rid of this picture, but remember we have these sort of positive fixed um, nuclei of the atoms. And the atoms essentially form some kind of lattice, and they don't move around. But in a metal, in a conductor, we have this big cloud of electrons, which are the negative charges. And, and these electrons are free to flow. If we put a force on it, um, and if we think about moving in the other direction, if the electrons move this way, since they're negatively charged, we're essentially going to get a current in that direction to the right. So there's a difference, because the negative charges are the ones that move in metal between the velocity vector of the electrons and the way we define the current. But that's OK. And we essentially have, can calculate our velocity by the electric field that's put on times the charge of the electron, the time between collisions, if you remember, and the mass of the electron. And we used this in the last lecture to calculate the conductivity, which happens to be a property of the material. And essentially what this says, in essence, is that positive charges remain fixed. The negative charges move inside a wire. And they move very quickly, because remember, the, the charge on the positive and negative charges is very large compared to the mass of the electron. And we learned that even fairly small electric forces can really accelerate these electrons to very, very high velocities. And so this is our first case, something we're very familiar with, which is the current or the electrons moving inside the wire. Now we're going to get a little strange and look at our second case. Um, and in this case, we consider that the wire is just sitting there. There's no electric field on it. There's no force. This cloud of electrons essentially is still, and the wire itself is not moving. And essentially what we're going to do is we're going to take a positive charge and think about a positive charge zipping outside of the wire. So just outside the wire, the positive charge is moving in that direction, and we define essentially a velocity vector v. Um, because we can accelerate charges to really, really high speeds with, without too strong of an electric field because of that charge to mass ratio we saw in the last slide, it turns out that Einstein's special relativity applies to this. And we're not going to go into special relativity. I'm not a physicist. I you know, never really did it. But there's something that happens with special relativity called the Lorentz Fitzgerald contraction. And essentially what it says is if something is moving really, really fast, things look like they've shrunk down in the direction of motion. So if we consider that this charge is moving in the x direction, everything in the frame of reference of the charge looks normal. So if this charge is inside a spaceship or somebody's riding along with this charge, the charge itself looks fine. Things always appear normal to where we're standing. But in the still frame of reference, in the frame of reference of the wire, length gets contracted. So things shrink down in the x direction. The factor of the contraction is given by this equation right here. And it turns out that unless the velocity is sort of an appreciable fraction of the speed of light, and remember c is our speed of light, and that's uh, 300 million um, meters per second, that unless we're moving a significant fraction of the speed of light, um, this thing under the square root sign is really tiny. But with charges, 
they can move quickly, and they can exert very large forces. So even if the thing under the square root sign there is small, there can still be some pretty appreciable forces generated by this. So, so what happens in this case? I've talked a lot, but what does it look like? It turns out that, that when the wire is still, this is not really what the wire looks like if somebody were sitting on top of this charge. So let's basically write somebody up there, you know, writing that charge. What that person sitting on top of the charge sees is things are compressed in the direction of motion. So in that direction, the direction the charge is moving, things get squished down. Everything looks a lot tighter. Notice, however, in this direction, which is orthogonal to the direction of motion, the spacing remains the th same. Things don't change in that direction, only in the direction that the charge is moving. So, to summarize case number two, if we have a charge moving outside the wire with any kind of appreciable velocity, it's going to see a spatial contraction in the direction the charge is moving that seems to squish space down in the direction things are moving, as given in the lower figure right here. Now, as I was making these slides, it turned out to be really difficult to explain the things I want to explain using the diagram I've used before, which is a, a bunch of positive charges that are fixed in place and a big cloud of negative electrons that, that are essentially all wrapped around it that can move. So essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a new picture, a new way of representing this, because this representation just doesn't work for what I want to explain very well. And essentially what we're going to do is we're going to say there's a certain amount of charge per unit volume that's positive charge, and I'm going to represent it just as a cylinder. And so essentially what we're going to do is have a, a reddish pinkish cylinder that's the positive charge basically per unit volume. And then essentially what I'm going to do is exactly the same thing for the negative charge. I'm going to represent these electrons, which are free to move, as sort of a green cylinder. And it also has essentially negative charge per volume. So coulomb per cubic meter would essentially be the, the units we'd use to represent charge per unit volume. The take-home lesson is that when you see these cylinders, this represents a charge distributed over the wire, and the pink ones are the positive atom cores which remain fixed, the green ones are the negative electrons which can move, and even though I've separated these charges in space to make it clear, these cylinders actually stretch the entire length of the wire and just sort of represent a charge per unit volume, and of course, we're not se separating the charges, we're keeping them on top of one another. The only difference is the pink ones don't move, the green ones are free to move. So now we're ready for our third case. We've examined two cases. One where we had essentially a current in the wire and this green cloud of electrons moved in that direction while the positive charges here stayed fixed. Um, and we called that current going that way because the charges are negative. We examined a second case where we had essentially a positive charge with a little guy riding it here. So let's write our, our little guy up there, zipping along outside the wire. And we saw in that case that there was sort of a compression of space if this velocity gets to be any significant fraction of the speed of light whatsoever. Um, it turns out that what happens is that because you have electrons moving inside the wire, they're moving along in the same direction as the guy sitting on the positive charge. So to a first approximation, those two frames of reference are the same. In other words, it's like sort of two cars going down the highway. Um, you both seem still with relation to one another, and everything seems perfectly normal. And so the negative charges are not compressed because in this case, case number three, negative charges are moving in that direction and our positive charge is actually moving in that direction. And if the velocities are anywhere close to one another, um, the frames of reference are going to be the same. This is not true, however, for the positive charges because they are remaining fixed within the wire. Those, those atom cores don't really move. And so essentially what you're going to do is you're going to get a compression of the positive charge in the wire, a squishing together, at least that's what the guy writing on the charge is going to see, and essentially no change in the density of the negative charges. It remains kind of spread out. Well, what results from this? What happens? Essentially what's going to happen is that you're going to get a higher charge density for the positive charge. These negative charges are pretty spread out. They're sort of scattered all throughout the wire. However, the positive charges are much more compressed within the wire. 
there's a lot more charges uh, per unit length or per unit volume because essentially that spatial dimension has gotten compressed. At least that's what this little guy writing the particle thinks um, due to Einstein's special relativity. So what happens in this case? If you have a current going in that direction, which means electrons which are negatively charged going in that direction, the same direction that the guy writing the particle is going, or this positively charged particle is going, it's essentially going to see a higher positive charge density. And we know if we have one positive charge, which is this high charge density right here, and another positive charge, which is the charge that's moving along outside the wire, they're going to push each other apart. There's going to be a force that pushes the positive charges away. So this little guy riding the electron is going to see a force and this particle is going to experience a force that pushes it out away from the wire. And this force only occurs in the case that one, this outside particle is moving, and two, the electrons in the wire are moving, or there's a current. This particle would not see the force for a wire that wasn't, wasn't carrying current, and of course there'd be no force if the outside particle was just stationary it wasn't moving because then essentially you'd have an equal density of positive and negative charge inside the wire so again to reiterate um, only a force when both and let's underline both because that's important sets of charges are moving. We only see a force when both there's a charge moving outside the wire and charges moving inside the wire. Let's explore this a little bit more and consider another case and now all we're going to do is keep exactly the same situation where the currents going in that direction which means the velocity of the electrons is in that direction but our particle with our little guy writing it so let's let's basically set our little guy up here writing our particle um, is essentially moving the opposite direction so instead of moving from left to right in this case it's moving from right to left um, well you're still going to get some compression of the positive charge due to special relativity but because the velocity differential is bigger between the negatives, negative charges that are inside the wire and the positive charge moving outside the wire, you're going to get greater compression or more squishing of the negative charges here. So what the guy writing the particle is going to see is he's going to see a higher net negative charge density. And we know that if we have a positive charge out here and a net negative charge in here, the force is going to pull in toward the wire. So now we have an interesting situation that the force that this moving particle sees near a wire that's carrying current depends on the direction the current is flowing and it depends on the direction the particle is moving. And so we've got a situation here where the force is a factor of multiple vectors. So how are we going to deal with this one? Well, let's, let's get our little piece of wire here, and we'll essentially say we have our current flowing in this direction, which means the velocity of the electrons essentially is going to be in the opposite direction. And we know that if we have the charge below the wire, the force is going to be upward toward the wire. Um, we can also look at the argument and say, okay, we should get exactly the same situation if the the charge is a little higher and going along not below the wire but right next to the wire. The force should still be inward because that's the direction that this charge differential is going to pull it thanks to Einstein's special relativity. And we can take a third case essentially where we have the velocity of the charge of a charge above a wire and the force should still be down toward the wire. So we've got a situation essentially where depending on the position of the particle, even though all the particles are moving in the same direction, the force is always going to pull the particle in toward the wire. It's always going to be an inward force. And you can imagine that describing this mathematically gets kind of tricky. Um, how are we going to resolve this situation? Um, not like with electrostatics where we had charges that always pushed things away or pulled it toward it, but now the direction of the force depends on the relative position and the velocities and the currents. Well, the way we do this is we think about the wire and the moving charges in the wire creating a separate force field and we're going to call that force field a magnetic field or a magnetic flux vector and we'll see the difference in a little while between those those two terms and the only way this force field can be for 
this to be consistent mathematically for this description, which which is really intuitively logical to make sense, is if we have this magnetic flux vector, which we're going to write B, and we're going to basically set it to mu times h. And B is the magnetic flux, so let's write flux down there and point to B. H is another vector that we use to describe the magnetic field and mu is something called the permeability and this is similar to the permittivity and we'll get to that in a little while but not to get too distracted with this essentially the current is going to create a magnetic field again a field of invisible force rays created by moving charges currents and this field of invisible force rays unlike the electric field doesn't go out but it wraps around the wire and now we have sort of a mathematical problem because essentially we've we've basically thought about this current creating another vector field that we call the magnetic flux vector B or the magnetic field H and this vector field of invisible force rays created by currents or charges that move act only on other charges that move but the direction it acts on them the force it applies is a factor of two vectors it's a function of the direction the charges are moving and it's a function of the direction the magnetic flux or magnetic field is pointing and so in order to calculate the direction of the force we need to understand how to multiply two vectors together and get another vector so let's explore that for a couple of slides before we get back to looking at forces it turns out that mathematically you can do this fairly straightforwardly you can multiply a vector times a vector and get another vector doing something called the cross product and I'm not going to go into the cross product there are a lot of good videos out there um, from Khan Academy and others on essentially what a cross product is and how to derive it and I really don't want to get into a lot of detail but I do want to give you sort of an overall sense of the cross product because we're going to need it to do magnetic field calculation well when you multiply two vectors and get another vector the general expression is this one you have some vector a and we remember we can write that vector a as the x component of a the y component of a and the z component of a cross product with another vector b which also has an x component a y component and a z component and it turns out that when you do the cross product you get a third vector that's very very complicated but it turns out the y and z components of a and b give you the x components the z and x components of a and b give you the y components of the cross product and the x and the y components of a and b are going to give you the z components of the cross product and this is very complicated looking but it's really not that hard it turns out that if you take any two vectors a and b no matter how they're oriented in space they're going to define a planar surface and so if i think of a vector a here and i simply move that vector over here so I've got a second vector A and a ve vector B on the bottom and move that vector up here so I have a second vector B notice that these two vectors like this have defined a surface so the way to think about a cross product is that multiplying two vectors defines a surface and we've already learned that the only way you can uniquely describe a surface is by a vector normal to the surface so if we think of of vector C being the cross product of vectors A and B C is going to point orthogonally or normal to the surface C is a surface normal so our cross product helps us to find things that are out of the plane that contain A and B and it turns out that that the length of vector C the magnitude of C is simply the area of the surface and since A and B need not be orthogonal they can essentially have some angle theta between them that's not 90 degrees uh, you get this expression right here for the area of the surface or the length of C now there are a lot of rules you kind of have to memorize or know where to look up in order to deal with cross products remember that when we multiply two vectors a and B um, because these vectors are going to create a third vector that's orthogonal to the plane that contains a and B we see Y and Z components give X components of that third vector and so on and so forth this can be hard to remember so one one sort of rule of thumb a lot of people use for this is to think about the determinant of a matrix so essentially what you do is to remember the cross product you only have to remember this matrix where you have your unit vectors on the top your a vector and your b vector and so you essentially take that element which is a diagonal of the matrix that diagonal of the matrix 
and that diagonal of the matrix, and these are all going to be the positive components that essentially appear here, here, and here. To calculate the negative components, you just go the opposite direction. So you have that element. That's essentially going to appear there. This one, which is essentially that negative element, and then these multiplied together right there, which gives you the negative element. So this is an easy way to remember the formula for the cross product. You just remember unit vectors, first vector, second vector. Okay, a couple more rules. It turns out that the commutative property of multiplication does not hold in vectors. If you take the cross product of A cross B, um, it's equal to the negative of B cross A because your surface normal is going to point in the opposite direction. So the order you multiply vectors matters. A second case is that a scalar times a cross product or a scalar times a vector in a cross product essentially is just a scalar times the cross product. That's pretty straightforward. Um, the third rule is that the cross product essentially defines a coordinate axis. So x cross y gives you z for the unit vector, z cross x gives you y, and y cross z gives you the x-axis. And we represent this notation in terms of what's called a right-hand rule. If you hold your hand up, as shown in the picture, your thumb points along the x-axis, your, your first, your index finger is going to point along the y-axis, and your middle finger is going to point along the z-axis. If you essentially do the same thing with your left hand, you'll be wrong. That's not how we define axes. So when working in three-dimensional space, we use this right-hand rule to determine how these things cross into one another. A fourth rule is that we can essentially take the cross product of the sum of two vectors and write it this way. Pretty straightforward. Um, we're going to use this one later on, so remember that one. Um, we can do the same essentially with the dot product and a cross product. We can rearrange the orders of dot products and cross products, which is useful. And then our sixth rule is sort of a long one, um, and I'm not even going to try to explain this one. But if you have three cross products, you can es essentially represent it as dot products and vectors like this. And this is going to come in useful in quite a while when we do some mathematical manipulations. Okay, now that we've got our cross product defined, we can actually write an expression or an equation for this force on a moving particle caused by the magnetic flux vector B, which, remember, is simply the permeability times the magnetic field H, and we'll get to those differences in a little bit. It turns out the force is essentially the amount of the charge Q times the velocity vector cross product with the magnetic field. So this expression here gives you the force, and it turns out that what you're going to find is that if you apply the right-hand rule in this case, you're always going to find that the force goes inward, as I've shown in these diagrams. We also use the right-hand rule, it turns out, to find the direction of the magnetic field created by the current. If we, we look right here, we see if we point our thumb of our right hand along the direction of the cur current, our, our fingers will curl like that in the direction the magnetic field is pointing. So this right-hand rule is very useful for determining these things. But the most important thing to recognize is that a moving charge near a current carrying wire is going to experience a force because that current carrying wire creates a magnetic flux or a magnetic field. We use the right-hand rule and this expression right here to determine what that force is. It turns out that in electrical engineering we very rarely deal with, with free particles that are flying along next to a wire. That's more of a physics thing than an electrical engineering thing. But we do deal with wires that are carrying currents that are close to one another. And so if we think of two wires, let's call it basically wire number one down here and wire number two down there, we know in our first wire we're going to essentially have um, a current element. And so we're going to think of a little tiny section of electrons, a little slice, that's essentially going to be moving in that direction. So it's going to have some velocity of the electrons that way. And the current, of course, is going to be in the opposite direction. And we can define exactly the same thing down here in wire number two, where we also have moving electrons. And you can see that essentially this is 
pretty analogous to the situation of a single charge zipping along outside the wire. You essentially have two little tiny elements of current that correspond to moving charges. So exactly the same laws are going to apply. It turns out that we, we derived our equation for the, the force of a charge with the velocity in the magnetic field, and we can pretty much imagine that wire number one is going to be creating our magnetic field, or our magnetic flux B. And we can calculate essentially what the charge is in wire number two um, if we simply take the fact that we're going to have negative E, because that's the charge on a single electron, in E, which is the density of electrons. And we, when we worked with conductivity, we looked into that. And essentially, the total amount of charge is going to be the amount of a single charge, the number of charges per unit volume, times the volume of this little cylinder, which is just A, the cross-sectional area of the wire, times DL, the length of that little cylinder. So if we think of one little slice of current, one little current element zipping along in place of our charge, uh, the overall charge Q is just going to be given by that. We also remember from conductivity we have an expression for the current density, which is the charge times the charge density times the velocity. And then we can see pretty easily that Q times V is just J times the volume of that little cylinder of our current element. And we can simply write this, um, since uh, J times the area is equal to the current, as the current flowing in wire 2 times a little vector of DL which essentially is pointing along the direction of that wire. So what this allows us to do, essentially, is to rewrite our equation for the force that's felt by wire 2. And so let's put an F2 down there from the magnetic field created by wire 1. So let's write a 1 down there as I naught, which is the current flowing in wire 2. Let's write I naught there, um, times DL, which is actually a vector because it has a direction, it's the direction the wire is pointing, and DL is just a little slice of it, cross product with the magnetic field B that's essentially going to be created by wire number one up here. Woof, that was a lot to deal with. Um, let's do a quick summary uh, to end this. Um, essentially what we see is that any time you have moving charges or replace that word moving charges with the word current elements, since that's really more of what we deal with in electrical engineering, but current elements are moving charges, they're just generally moving in something. These current elements are going to see relativistic effects, and they actually experience relativity even though we don't in our ordinary lives for two reasons. One, charges move really fast, and they move really fast because they have very small mass compared to the amount of, of force that other charges will exert on them. Um, we know these current elements are going to produce a magnetic flux vector B or a magnetic field H, um, and it's a vector field, and it goes around the wire. It does loops. Um, we know that only charges or current elements that are moving are going to feel magnetic forces. If there's not motion of electrons, you don't get a magnetic field. And even if there is a magnetic field, it doesn't push on any charge that's not moving. So essentially what we're doing is we're sort of rederiving all the stuff we did with electric fields and charges for moving current elements. Um, we know that the moving charges are going to feel a force from the magnetic flux B, or equivalently, Remember, the magnetic field with B equal the permeability times H, the magnetic field. So we can, we can just swap those out pretty easily. But essentially, moving charges are going to feel a force given either by the charge times the velocity crossed with the flux vector field B or the current and the little segment length segment the current's moving in crossed with B. Forces are still the same either way. Because we're doing a cross product, the forces are orthogonal to the plane defined by the velocity and the magnetic flux vectors. So the forces are not going to be in the plane, but orthogonal to the plane defined by those two vectors or those two vectors. We use the right-hand rule to determine the direction of the force and the magnetic flux vector, and that although we can understand the magnetic field as 
the electric field in the case of special relativity, it turns out that what we're going to do is we're going to treat the electric and magnetic fields as two separate fields. And as we'll see, electric fields come from charges, whether they're moving or not. We only get magnetic fields when we have two sets of charges that are moving, or equivalently, two current elements, because current essentially implies a moving charge. Wow, that was a lot to go through. Let's see if we can make some sense and do some calculations of this in the next couple of videos.